Welcome to the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage, where rude mechanicals do magic. Hello, I'm Bronze Age, Director of the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage. And today, we're going to look at two drawers made two different places, two different times. This first drawer is comes from a mass-produced dresser from a furniture mill. But what makes it very interesting is the corner joints. These are hand-cut dovetails. The problem is, when you're in a furniture mill, it's easy to saw out a board like this and plane it flat and even cut this groove if you can get your cutting tool moving fast enough. It takes something like a 10 inch saw blade here. These teeth have to go past the wood at around 150 miles an hour in order to get a good, good clean cut. And what that means for this particular blade, we've got to be spinning a little over 5,000 RPM to get that speed. Now, as the blade gets smaller, you got to go faster, lots faster, so that by the time you're down to this size, which is a dovetail cutter for a modern router, in order to cut this kind of a shape, you've got to be going about 20,000 RPM. And uh, with the kinds of machinery that they had back in the 1800s, it just simply wasn't possible to get 20,000 RPM on something this small uh, without it all coming apart. Very dangerous. Even cutting this kind of molding here, which would have been cut on a machine, they would have had a big, giant cutting wheel to uh, make that profile right there make out a couple of yards of it, saw it up, and then they would glue it and nail it down. But, for the dovetails, there was a bunch of guys sitting on benches, kind of like this one right here, with saws and chisels, and all they did all day long was cut out this speed, this pace, cut out that shape right there, and push them all together. Now, this drawer very possibly could have been made in a furniture mill where all the machinery was powered by a water wheel. The water wheel would have driven a long shaft that went from one end of the building to the other, and large flat belts went down from the shaft to each individual machine. And you can imagine something like that, pretty lumbering and slow, and that's basically why they couldn't get shaft speeds fast enough to turn little small bits like we have on modern day routers. It was only a few decades later when electricity came to the industrial furniture manufacturing business. Now, electricity meant that machines could be made which could spin very, very fast. More than fast enough to spin a bit like this and cut dovetails in the edges of the boards, as well as go all the way around. And you would have a row of these, just basically spitting out drawer pieces all day long. And I imagine all the old guys on the dovetail benches, I guess they just retired. Now the reason this drawer is on the bench is fairly obvious. It's falling apart. Not only has it fallen apart, but uh, it's got some old repairs, which of course are the bane of any new repair. Now I'm one who is always grateful for small favors. In this case, the small favor is they tried to repair the drawer ends with uh, carpet tacks instead of some kind of glue, as well as uh, this stuff, some kind of wood filler. I really have no idea what it is. But they went and tried to use a little small piece of fiberboard to hold it back together. So the first order of business is to get all the carpet tacks out of it and clean as much of this stuff off of it as possible. bottom panels are a bunch of thin boards that have been edge glued together and then 
the edge plane down so that uh, it will go into the groove in the drawer sides. This one was broken at the glue joint and this is where they tried to repair it. I've cleaned that off and once I get the rest of this wood putty or whatever it is off of it, be ready to start putting the drawer back together. Okay, I have the repairs done that were needed on the drawer, which was uh, putting in this patch piece where the splinter was broken off and lost, gluing this bottom panel back together. But the greatest amount of the work was simply getting all this mud that somebody had tried to use as a repair material out of the grooves because uh, they basically just filled it up. I don't know what they were trying to do. Well, I do, but there was no way that was going to work. So, reassembly. Start off with protecting our piece here from the, the workbench, or the block and a piece of padding. Get it nailed down, or I should say clamped down. Nice and tight. So that's an extra set of hands right there. Put the center piece in here. Get our bottom panels slid in. Which put them in right. It helps. Now I use a clamp block like this because getting the back into this thing is going to be a little awkward. Now the back on this particular drawer doesn't have a groove for the bottom like that. And this is the traditional way that all drawers were made going way back. And simply the panels were allowed to, fle to flow freely in the sides in the front and they were nailed down. Well, that looks pretty nice. Dry fit is the most important part of any furniture repair. You really have to make sure it's going to actually fit and go together, be straight and be square before you put the glue on. Because while you can make adjustments while you're clamping up with glue, it makes a big mess. So now what I do is take this all back apart and reproduce this procedure here with the glue. Um, nobody really wants to see that. It's just slow and tedious. The last step is to hammer down the uh, center support and the bottom panels. Now, this is important because this is what holds the drawer square, keeps it from getting racked, which will definitely make it hard to open and close. Now we can turn our attention to the slightly newer drawer. This is a serpentine front and uh, the way they managed to make this curve was by stacking up blocks like this 
gluing them all together and then just sawing the curve out like that as it went along. That had the advantage of uh, saving a lot of wood. It gave you something to do with all your little short pieces. As you look through here, you can actually see the joint, but that also left a lot of glue joints. And we've got a block that when it got wet, that came loose, it fell out. A little small piece down on this end. So before I start putting this back together and fixing all this loose veneer, I have to make a piece to repair this corner. artistic work at the belt sander that looks like it's going to fit pretty good except for the problem with this groove right here and cutting that kind of groove in such a small piece that's a pretty dicey operation so what I'm going to do is fasten it to a bigger piece of wood so I can take it over to the router table and hope that I just get that go right through in one pass and don't take any fingernails with it. put the block back in the drawer I'm going to use tight bond original now when I go to uh, put the veneer reattach it I'm going to be using hide glue which uh, dissolves in water and comes loose and the reason for that is really kind of simple and sort of altruistic at the same time, which is, I know that nobody wants this drawer to come apart again, but there is a possibility that somebody may want to re-veneer it. And if I go and glue all this veneer back down with uh, tight bond, the PVA glue, that's gonna make their job a lot more difficult. So even though that possibility is fairly remote, I'm gonna give the guy that comes after me just a little bit of a break. Now we move on to preservation of the uh, veneer. And I call it preservation because it's not restoration. There's nothing can be done to restore this uh, veneer. What I want to do is to prevent any more of it from coming off. And that means securing these loose pieces. There's actually two layers here. The way this is done, especially with these blocks, is there would be a fairly thick layer put down and that would smooth out any joints or sanding marks or whatever they've got in these, uh, these base blocks. And then the appearance level or appearance layer goes on on top of that. And what I want to do is to get a nice thin layer of glue down in there as far as I can get it and then get this clamp down and let it set up and that will keep this loose edge from peeling back which of course would start the whole thing across and it being on a curve like this no easy way to clamp it except to just overwhelm it with all these alligator clamps 
and it will only take a couple hours for this to set up and I can go back to work on rebuilding the rest of the drawer box. Now the construction of this drawer is slightly different than the other one. This drawer, the bottom panel, is held in on all four sides by the groove, which means that you have to have the panel in place when you're putting the drawer together. Now the bottom didn't survive the flood, but we do have one small piece of it, and that means that I won't have to trace it off the, uh, the bottom of the drawer. I can actually use this as a template for uh, the new bottom. Well, that's not too bad for a drawer that uh, spent way too much time underwater. All I have to do now is take all this back apart, glue it, clamp it back again, and uh, I'll be almost done with this project. One of the problems of repairing furniture that's gotten wet is that when wood gets wet, it changes shape. And when it dries out, it doesn't go back to its original shape. So each of these boards here and here are actually cut. And when I go to put this back in the cabinet that it came out of, I'm probably going to have to do quite a bit of planing and shaving to get it back to where it fits in the original one. These two drawers are separated probably by maybe 30 or 40 years, but it's actually a full generation in technology between the older one and the newer one. So, this is Bronze Age, the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage. I hope you would uh, click the like button, the thumbs up thingy, and uh, subscribe. Uh, and we put out a video about once a week, so. Hope to see you again next week, and again, thank you for watching.